Okay, good morning everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. So today we're going to be talking about a variety of different things. Everything from finishing up our amortized analysis to talking about trees and we might get the priority cues today. Uh, so just a few reminders. Remember that assignment one is due tonight by 11.59 p.m. Remember, as I said, I am going to keep the submission open until about 8.30 in the morning the next day. It's 8.30. It's 8.30 Regina time. Uh, so if you find yourself really just needing that extra time, I'm not going to penalize you if you do it any time before 8.30 in the morning. Tomorrow morning. <laughs> uh, just this is on paper. Uh, I want to make sure that you just have that just in case there's any technical issues really close to the midnight. Is that clear, everybody? Uh, furthermore, I put out assignment two last night. Assignment two is due October 13th. Uh, in this assignment, uh, in assignment two, I'll be getting you to give you some experience proving a lower bound. I'll get you to try proving it using a reduction. And I'll try to get you to get me and present me a best possible algorithm for that problem. This is one that's going to be closely related to assignment one, uh, where you actually had a problem called the duplicate problem. We're going to, I'm going to get you to try to establish a lower bound in this case. Um, then after that, uh, you'll be doing some stuff with amortized analysis. So in this case, what will happen is I'll give you two scenarios and your job is to present to me the amortized complexity in each scenario. It's going to be involving cues, so it should be kind of fun. Uh, so just I would recommend when you're doing that problem, take a look at the example we did last day. And also, if you just really need to see the second example, look in the notes. I have all the details in the lecture notes. Uh, you may find that really helpful for the first scenario of the two. Uh, then after that, there is a, I get you to design me a recursive algorithm that's going to do some stuff involving a tree. So it's able to compute a so-called max sum path from a root to a leaf. Uh, where I give you a bunch of numbers in the tree and your job is to give me a path that computes me the largest possible number you can get from a path that goes from the root to a leaf in a tree. Uh, but I'll let you take a look at that. So in that case, I'll get you to give me some, some brief description of the algorithm with some pseudocode and I'll get you to compute the time complexity for me. And then finally, I'll let you have some fun with some heaps. So that's generally what assignment two is about. It's most of it you can probably get started on almost right away after this lecture, if you find yourself ha having some time. Uh, the only one that you'll have to wait a little bit longer for is uh, the final problem. But everything else you should be able to start. Uh, but by the end of this week, you should have that. So, are we all good with that? Are we all good? First, hopefully had, everybody had a good weekend. I forgot to ask about that. Um, but uh, but with that being said, one other thing, just remember about the onboarding quiz. Don't forget about that. Uh, I will uh, I will be keeping an eye on my email about things. I know I've gotten a couple emails involving this. Uh, I'll I'll address that as soon as I can. Okay. So that being said, I want to come back to amortized analysis just with a couple of remarks, just for the sake of completeness, because oftentimes when I teach things in this class, I'll be trying to expose you to ideas so that you have some familiarity with things that are out there in the algorithms landscape. So that's kind of really what I want to do, is I want to show you a little bit about data structures, a bit about algorithms, and I'm going to go quite deep on a lot of things, but other times I'm going to just try to say, hey, look, this thing exists if you find yourself interested in studying a little further for yourself. So this is just an example of two such things. Uh, so I, last day I showed you using the, am, uh, the aggregate method, how to compute the amortized complexity. And in that case, I showed you how geometric growth for resizing a, an array for a dynamic array is actually very good from an amortized standpoint. If I give you an unordered array and I want to resize it, the scheme actually works really well. You end up with a constant time amortized complexity, which is really good. Like that's, that's excellent. Uh, but the worst case analysis would not account for this. Now, I want to mention briefly that there's a couple of other approaches that you can use for amortized complexity that you can use to derive as well. There's so-called accounting or banker's method. In this case, I want you to think about the cost that we had. Remember how I talked about how we have inexpensive operations and we have this expensive operation. So in this case, um, in the aggregate method, what I did is I summed up all of them, all the operations in my sequence of n operations. 
I try to figure out a sequence that maximizes this. So try to make that sum, that cost as big as I possibly can for the n operations. Then I divide it by the number of operations, right? It seemed quite natural for the definition I gave you for amortize analysis. Here's another way you can think about it. Now imagine all those inexpensive operations, like if I were to assign a price to them. So I did sort of this last day where I had my inexpensive operations, I assigned a cost of one to them, and the expensive ones were cost, I assigned a cost of i to them for a given operation i. So in this perspective, what you would do is you assign a price to a cheap operation. So every time, say, you just insert into the array, you would have a price of one. So you get one dollar every time you do an inexpensive operation from doing this. But what you do is when an expensive operation happens, you use all of this little bit of charging extra off the prices. That's kind of the intuition behind it. You use that to pay off the expensive operations. So if the expensive operation is worth I, and I save, I basically saved up enough bucks to cancel out the expensive operation, that's pretty good. Or at least I can get some amount back each time. And the goal is we're caring about how much I get back each time in total. So I just want to give you a general flavor for this, is that you can think of it almost like taking out a loan. So imagine you have a loan, you take out some money for that, and you're paying off your loan, but you can choose how you do it. So sometimes people will pay off little increments, some will pay off a big chunk of it, a large lump sum. Some people like that phrase. Maybe it's because of the word lump, I don't know. Uh, but some people like to pay off their loan small pieces, they have an interest rate. Uh, sometimes that's favorable, not favorable, depending on what the interest rate is. Some people will pay off that in increments. Some will pay off a big chunk. Depending on what the situation is, you pay off the loan based on generally a scheme kind of like this. So you, you pay off little bits, off a little bit, little bit, little bit, and then depending on how much you take off in the end matters about the difference of the costs. But I'll let you think about this. This is just me just trying to expose you to this idea. So another approach is this potential method. Now this one is rather popular with more advanced data structures than the ones I've seen in, I'm talking about in this class. In fact, some of these you can use the potential method for. Uh, this one is more inspired by physics. So very often when you have a system in physics, uh, you have a so-called potential sometimes. So for example, if you're familiar with potential gravity, for example, or potential energy. Uh, potential energy in particular would be more the interesting one. So when I put a ball up in the air and I put it onto a platform, this is in contrast to kinetic energy where I push it, I move it. There's going to be some potential energy stored for the system and for the ball, right? But as I modify the system, the state of potential can change. So the inspiration here is that you derive this thing called the potential function. This is often the most complicated part of this process. And what you do is you measure the cost of the operations as they happen. So you have these differences before and after each one of the operations, and you measure that difference. And you do this each time, but you can do this for each one of them, but the overall goal is to figure out what the difference is from the beginning to the end of the system. So you can figure out the difference from the start to the end. So for example, if I have my ball and I have it up here on a ramp, if I nudge it over, the potential energy might go down as it speeds up down a ramp, uh, but at the same time, it could rest, and then the kinetic energy is gonna be mostly gone, right? But then I'll be back to potential energy. But notice the state of the system changed, right? Uh, so this is naturally what I'm thinking about when I say this. I'm saying, hey, look, I wanna know what happens at the beginning and at the end. I wanna know what happens with, between the difference between these two states. So when the states would represent, in my potential function is each time I do an operation. So this should give you just a general, a basic flavor for what I mean. So, so oftentimes when this is being used, you do some operation, you figure out how much does that change the system each time I do it. So that the goal is to figure out what happens after I do n operations, how does it alter the potential in the system? Uh, generally, you'll find that this banker's method is quite similar to the aggregate method in how it's used. The potential method is often very tricky because you have to worry about this so-called potential function. Sometimes it comes out of, like, if there's something I could tell you, almost comes out of straight up intuition or magic, it's this thing. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's magic, but it's, uh, it's very, very powerful stuff. 
But yeah, some data structures, they do use some of these techniques for doing the amortized complexity. This one's rather popular for very complicated data structures. Uh, but I just want to give you a flavor for these. Do these. Does this give you a good flavor for what these are about? So you can think of one like finance or accounting way of looking at how I have my expensive or inexpensive operations um, versus this potential method, which is just, hey, look, like, <laughs> look, I look at what happens in the system at the beginning. After I do the end operations, I end up with a system at the end. And I want to know what happens in between with these potentials. So that I, at the overall, I want to know how much the potential difference, like what was the difference between the start and the end. But yeah, I just want to give you a flavor for what these are about. So if you ever came across them, you're like, what the heck is that? Uh, you have some idea of what that means. Okay. If there aren't any questions, I'm going to move on to what we're going to talk about next. Because that's all I have to say about amortized analysis, believe it or not. Uh, we might use amortized analysis later in this class. We'll see. But I want to take a little detour for this. Uh, because I want to make sure everybody's sort of on equal footing about something. I want to talk a little bit about trees before we proceed. Uh, so I'm going to take a little detour. So I'm going to take a detour. I'm going to talk briefly about trees. Now, previous you, in 2.10, you will have talked about, for certain, I'm certain you've talked about binary search trees and possibly binary trees just more broadly at some point in 2.10. <laughs> He's speaking for the trees. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So we're going to talk about trees just generally. So I want to give you some terminology, and then we're going to do design a recursive algorithm for solving a problem on a tree. So that you have a good example, and this one will be very useful for when you're dealing with the assignment. Uh, so for trees, uh, just want to make sure everybody's on the same footing. A tree can be viewed as an abstract. So a tree is an abstract, an abstract model of a hierarchical system. That's the fun word of the day, hierarchical. Our call structure. If you're not familiar with that word, all I'm saying is that it has a series of levels to it. <laughs> so, so you have, say for example, you may have like a file system. In a file system, you have folders and directories where you, your root of the file system is, of course, the core directory uh, contains all your files, right? And then you work your way down. So a file system is hierarchical, for example. How about an organization of a company? Organization of a company. So often companies will have like a board of directors, they have a president or something like that, and they'll have a different hierarchy, right? You'll have like the president or the CEO, whatever it might be, up here at the top. Then you have your managers down here somewhere, and then you'll have like the customers down here. Actually, not the customers, the employees. Um, we don't employ the customers, okay? We have the employees down here at the bottom of the hierarchy. So, so a lot of things can be modeled by trees. Um, you may have seen trees before. For example, you may have heard of binary trees before. So I just want to make sure everybody's on the same footing about, about this. So I'm just going to make sure we're all on the same footing about the terminology we use for a tree. Are we all okay with that? So I shouldn't be pulling this out of my butt somewhere, right? Uh, so, okay, okay, we're good. So we're going to be interested in so-called rooted trees. So, so this is in contrast to just any tree, which we'll talk about graphs later in this class. Uh, but we're only going to be interested in so-called rooted trees. So in a rooted tree, we have a structure that looks kind of like this. It's just an example where we designate a node or vertex to be called the root. So for example, A vertex or node A here is the root. And each one of these circles I have here, this is a node or vertex. So I'm just gonna call them nodes or vertices, sorry, nodes or vertices if we're talking plural. So not to be confused with, uh, so plural is nodes and ver vertices is the plural for vertex. Sometimes people will incorrectly say that it's vertexes. This is not correct. Don't, don't say vertexes, it's kind of cringy. Um, don't, don't do that. Um, it's vertices. Uh, so, 
there's kind of the vertices, and then you have these edges, links, or arcs. Uh, so these things, I'll often refer to them as edges. It depends on the, really the context you talk about the tree. Like technically you could think of these as so-called directed edges because they form a parent-child relationship. So for example, if I look at node B, node B's parent is A. Likewise, the children of B are E and F, but the descendants of B are E, F, I, J, and K. Furthermore, the ancestors of J are F, B, and A. So these are just some general flavors of things. Also, uh, one other thing is if I have, say, say, two children of a node, and they're both children of that direct node, say vertex B, or node B. So if I give you node B and I ask, what's the siblings of B? I would ask, okay, it's E and F. So these are children for which they are the direct, direct children of, of, of B here. So E and F are siblings. So there's all sorts of other terminology. It can go quite deep. Uh, just a few other things I just want to point out is that if I want to know the depth or level, the depth or level of a node, so I want to know the depth or the level of a node, this is just simply going to end up being the number of ancestors. So for example, if I have, say, say vertex or node E, so E has depth, so E has depth, let's look at it. how many ancestors does E have? It go, its direct parent is B and the parent of B is A. So there's two ancestors. So now there's two ways you can look at this, the number of ancestors or the number of edges that it takes me to go from, from that node to the root. So just referring to the depth, and of course, if you want to talk about the height, the height is just very simple. It's the maximum depth of any node. So far, this shouldn't be too alien to anybody. Is this okay with everybody? Just you maybe know you might know this terminology from a binary search tree perspective, possibly. You, or if you've seen things like B trees or anything like that, same terminology I'm just using here. There's nothing that should be too crazy. Are we all good with this? Or any questions about what I just described here on the board? So just the only difference between say this and a binary tree is that notice I can have as many children as I like for any one node. So it's very general. So for example, if you've seen bee trees and things like that, they have structures that look, kind of look more like this. Um, so uh, one other thing is the nodes that have no children, they're often referred to as a leaf node. So we already briefly talked about this notion before. And any node that is doesn't that has at least one child is it called an internal node. So we'll refer to those as internal nodes. Sometimes leaf nodes are called external nodes. So it kind of makes sense because if you have an internal node, then there's an external node. Get it? Get it? Um, but are we all good with this terminology? I just want to make sure that we're clear about this. Okay, I think we're good. Because I'm going to do an example of where we're going to try to compute something on this tree. So. Uh, one thing I do want to make a remark about is that you might ask, Dan, how the heck do you implement that? <laughs> I will, in the notes, I'm going to have a linked tree implementation. Uh, so I can, so I'll have a picture there showing you how you can implement one of these trees. Uh, the classic way you do this is that you just create nodes as you would with like any other tree that you've been used to. And you'll, instead of having just direct links from like say, for example, the binary tree or binary search tree, you'll have a designated left child and a right child, right? And you'll have these as attributes for your node, probably. Because there's many children, what you'd do is you'd have a list of references to nodes. So you'd store this in some collection. And because collections tend to be iterable, so you can iterate over them, 
one after the other. We can typically use things like for each structures or for loops to go through each one of the elements or just a while loop, for example, if you're using something like an iterator. If you know what an iterator is, uh, that's a that's one where you can iterate through all of the children and you can do each get each one in constant time this way. But yeah, in the notes I have that and I also have an ADT. So if you want to know like, well, okay, so what are some operations you can do on trees? Uh, there's an ADT I've listed there for you if you want to just get some more details about it. Oh no, I lost my turtle. The turtle fell. I bulked them off. Okay, so I want to do an example with you. Actually, before I do that, I want to make sure we have one property clear with everybody. So. Here's a, a very helpful tree property. So here's a, a very powerful but very simple tree property. So I'm going to let the M be the number of edges and N be the number of nodes. So you may know this relationship between the edges and the nodes in any tree. So this is true regardless of it being rooted or not. Um, but this is a very powerful one. And we'll often use this. Is that if I want to know how many edges there are in any tree, the number of edges is always going to be one less than the number of vertices or nodes. So we often will use this fact very often when we do analysis involving trees more generally. So you might ask, Dan, how the heck do you prove this? Let me just give you a quick, quick sketch. I have a proof in the notes if you want to just see it. It's really short. It's like two sentences. It's just a counting argument. But let me just kind of give you an idea of what it works like. So let me just, let me just get over to my picture. Okay, this is good enough. Okay. so. You might ask, Dan, how the heck do I know that m, m is equal to n minus 1? So you might ask, Dan, how is that true? So you use a counting argument. So you do this. Watch this. So if I have a node, I can pair each one with the link or edge that directly connects to it. So like this. So I can pair each one like this. So notice I can pair each, each, uh, each node with the link that gets it to its parent. I can do it for each one, right? So I paired every one except for one, the root. So you might ask, Dan, well, how many edges are there? Well, look, I paired every single one with a node except for one, the root. And that's where it comes from. So you can use a counting argument to derive this. Is that cute? I like to think of them like suckers. <laughs> you just take one off and you can lick it. So that's a helpful property that I want you to be aware of because we're going to use that. Are we all good with this so far? Am I making sense? I just need to make sure I'm not losing anybody. So if we're all, I see, I see the thumbs up, so we're good. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, the problem of computing the height of any tree, any rooted tree. So we're going to consider the computing the height of a tree. So that's what we're going to consider. That's going to be the recursive example we're going to do. This is going to be quite similar to so to what you're going to be doing on the assignment. So pay attention to this. Um, so you might ask, if I give you a tree that looks like this, maybe. And I and I say this is the root r right here. 
and I would like to know how I can compute the height of this tree. Now, you might know how to do this with a binary tree, or you may have seen this even. This is pretty awesome if you did. Um, the one thing that I really want you to observe about trees is they have a very recursive structure to them. So for example, if I take and root, imagine if I took and I imagine this was the root of the tree. You'd agree with me that if I just ignore that, this is also a tree, right? So these three nodes would form a tree where this is the root if I imagined it as a subtree. I could do the exact same thing over here. So I imagine all of this right here. That's also a tree, right? And I can imagine if this was the root of that tree, that that's it's still a tree, right? <laughs> So I want us to use this fact to compute the height of, of a tree. So, so we can write a recurrence relation a recurrence relation to compute compute the height of the tree. given a node R. So we're going to derive a, a recurrence relation. Now, if you're not familiar with what that means, you'll, you'll see the picture, see it in quite quickly and be like, okay, that's what it means. Um, you might know this under a couple other names. So I'm going to define something I'm going to call the height of a node R. And there's going, we actually used something kind of like this last day, but I'm going to recursively define the height for you. That's what makes it a recurrence relation. I'm going to define the height in terms of the height of smaller components. So I'm going to have two cases here. So I have a question for you. So imagine I only look at this node right here and I just treat that as its own tree. If I asked Dan, what's the height of just this subtree? What's the height of that? Because that's a leaf right there. There has no children. Somebody tell me. If I just look at only this node right here, and I told you, hey, Dan, what's the height of that? Yeah, the height is zero, right? Very good. So look at the height of this would be zero, right? And I can say that for any one of the leaves here, right? So if I look and isolate any one leaf, I could tell you its height if I were to consider it and root it as its own subtree. All of these are going to have height zero, right? So if R is a leaf, then I know the height is going to be zero. Now I have this other case, and now this is where we have to be a bit more careful. So if R is internal, so there's only two kinds of nodes here. There's leaf nodes and internal nodes. So if I define a case for this, then I've defined how I can get the height. Ah, let's see. So somebody has an idea. Height of a node is the sum of the ch height of the children of the nodes. We don't need the sum. We don't need the sum. We need something else, not the sum. It starts with an M, it starts with an M. So I want to go back to my picture here. And suppose I consider this tree right here. So each one of these children have height zero. Oh, you mean max. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So notice that I, I, I need one ancestor to get me to right here for any one of the nodes in my tree, right? So that's the maximum depth. So the height of this subtree rooted at this node is one. And if I were to keep going like this, I can take this whole, whole subtree where that's the root. Look, it's between zero and one. I take the one because that's the larger subtree, right? So I just add one to it every time I go up. And I could do the same thing here. Okay, what's the height of this one? That's one. And I could consider the entire tree like this. Boom, 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 boom. I have one, zero, and two. I just take the two and I add one to it because I require going up one more ancestor. So the height of this tree is three, right? So naturally, I'm just going to write that down over here. So what did I do? I just take the maximum height among my children, and then I add one to it. So I get the max of the child 
C of R. So I'm going to take the maximum of the children, child C of R of the height of R, sorry, height of C, the height of C, I'm starting running out of space, plus one. So I take the maximum height among all the children and I add one to it. So does everybody see how I got this recurrence relation? So I'm going to write out some pseudocode for computing it now, because now I have some way of describing the height to you. So I'm going to write out some pseudocode. So let me describe how I can compute the height of the tree as an algorithm. So once we describe the algorithm, we're going to analyze it. And you're going to see that even though you see a little bit of recursion stuff going on here, there's still a lot of properties a tree has that makes this a little easier. Sure, the last part, you're talking about computing the overall height for the second case. When you compute the overall height, the, remember, I have, imagine I have each subtree, each with its own root r. And I'm going to call that c. So each one of those has its own height. And if I, I imagine I have a node up here that's the direct parent, it's the parent of each one of those children. It takes me one edge to get up to the parent, right? So I take the maximum among all the children. So, because remember, the height is the maximum depth. If I've computed the depth of, of the whole overall tree for each one of them, it's height. Then I just add one to it. I pick the largest one, which that's the definition of the height, right? So hopefully that helps a little bit here. So let me describe, I'm going to use some pseudocode here. So I'm going to go algorithm, algorithm, and we're going to have height. So I'm going to call it height r. So as input, so remember I described the input and the output. I do this every time I'm going to do this. Root r of the tree. Of the tree. Now in the context we're going to use it, it's going to end up being parts of the tree, but that's the initial input is the root, the root of the overall tree. The output is just going to be very simple. It is just the height of the tree. So it's the height of the tree. And now because this is going to end up being a recursive, recursive algorithm, because you can see I've described the height in terms of itself, right? So you can see right away I'm going to need a base case and a recursive case. So I'm going to write out the base case first because it's easier. So if I have if, so if r is a leaf, if r is a leaf, then I'm just going to, going to return zero because that's what we established. So if r is a leaf, I'm going to return 0. Otherwise, otherwise, I'm going to create a variable. I'm going to call it max height. And I'm going to assign it to be negative 1 for now, because the height is always 0 or greater with, with the convention we're using here. So the idea is I'm going to have a loop that's going to scan through and compute the heights of each of the children. And I'm going to take the largest of them. So I'm going to basically do like a linear scan over my children. So I'm going to use, I'm going to say for each, for each child C of R, do the following. So I'm going to compute the height. I'm going to assign that to a variable called H. I'm going to compute the height of C height of C. And of course, if I run into a better height that I've run into, I'm going to update max height. So just like if I'm computing the largest number and I'm doing a linear scan, I'm using the exact same idea. If H is greater than max height, then I better update max height. Then max height is going to be assigned h. And that's the end of my loop. Notice that now I have the base case 
and the recursive case, but I need to finish off the recursive case because I have to tell you what I'm supposed to return. Remember, I take the largest height among all my children, and then I do what? I add one to it. So I'm going to just return max height, and I'm going to add one to it. So I'm going to return max height. I return max height, and I add one to it. And boom, there we go. So look at that. So notice the parallels between the recurrence relation we had and the algorithm we have here. So notice that really I've just taken a couple of ideas. I just took the notion of what the height of the tree is, and then all I did was I took the idea that we usually use to compute the maximum in an array. So, so I took these two ideas and I slammed them together and that's how I get this. So notice I have this base case, then here all I'm doing is, doing is a literal, literal scan through all my children computing the height, and if I get a bigger one, I hang on to that height. So are we all good with this algorithm? Is everybody kind of, is this clear everybody? So notice that this is a recursive algorithm. I haven't done an example with a recursive algorithm at this stage yet. That's why I want to do an example with you. So when I do this analysis, I'm going to have to be a bit careful because notice that there's this recursion kicking around. So I have a little bit more of a thorough explanation in the notes, so I recommend reading that after class when I post it. Uh, but And that's the way I typically would do it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to isolate out the parts just like I did before, where I identify constants. So I'm going to use this approach to do this. But the biggest trick I'm going to give you, this is kind of a general strategy you can use when analyzing recursive algorithms. It's a very basic strategy. Sometimes you have to be more careful though is that I'm just going to first just pretend this recursion isn't here. I'm going to ignore the recursive call. So I'm just going to ignore this and try it just like if it was an L, a, 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 a basic operation. So I'm just going to ignore this happens just right now. I'm just going to ignore this recursion. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to count up all the non-recursive work. So I'm just going to count up all the operations if I ignore that recursion. And then I'm going to see how the recursion affects all of these operations. And I count up how many times that's going to happen in relation to it. If I do this, then I should be able to get the overall running time because I've accounted for the non-recursive work of any one call. And then I have accounted for the recursion, which in relation will tell me how I'm supposed to split up this non-recursive work into its base case and its recursive case. So we're going to see that how this is going to play out here in a moment. Uh, so, I'm just going to do what I usually do. So, I'm, first, I'm just going to note here I'm going to ignore the recursion. So, I'm going to ignore the recursive call. That's the first thing I'm going to do. And then I'm going to analyze this just like I would the other day, <laughs> like some while back. So, what I can do is I can identify constants for parts of this, and then I'm going to take those pieces and isolate them for the base case and the recursive case. So you'd agree with me that this if part, now you might ask, Dan, how do I check if, if, a, if a node is a leaf or not? You just simply check if it has any children or not. And because, remember I told you, you can implement this node using a collection for the children. You can keep a counter of how many children you have, or you can just simply check the size of the collection that contains all your children. So you could do this whole step here in some constant number of times. So I'll call it C1. So I can do that in some C1 operations. Now, inside of here, I have, I have this else block here. So I have everything outside of this for loop. You'd agree with me that returning this plus one and this all take a constant number of operations. The stuff all outside this loop. This and this together, this is going to take some constant, we'll call it C2. Call that C2. Then in here, if I ignore this recursion, you might say, okay, well, how many operations happen here? Well, all of this, ignoring, pretending, remember, I'm pretending this does, this is not happening, right? I just assume it's some constant number of operations. 
that's going to happen there. This is going to take some constant C3 number of operations. And then you might ask, Dan, how many times does this loop happen? Well, it happens based on the number of children, right? But what's this? Well, how many times does this happen? The number of iterations uh, is, of course, equal to the number of children, which I'm going to call numchild. I'll call it numchild of r. That's the name I'm going to give this. If you look at my ADT in the notes, you'll see I give it the exact same name. Uh, so if I want to know how many times this iterates, it's going to be based on the number of children. So you might ask, Dan, how do you put this all together then? So I have all the bits and pieces here. Now I'm going to have to move over to this board. So just please keep in mind these three constants and the number of times this loop happens. So uh, let's see if I can get as much as I can here. Uh, so we'll keep it. We'll keep it about there. That way, um, I'm just going to make sure I make a note for myself. Okay, there we go. That way we have most of the algorithm there. Okay, so let's compute the time complexity. So the time complexity here. Uh, so what happens in the base case? Just this, right? It doesn't go into this else block. So you know in the base case, C1 operations are going to happen. Okay, so, so there are C1 operations, C1 operations in the base case. And how many, how many operations in the recursive case? Well, we have C2, right, these guys here. And then I have the number of iterations based on the number of children of R. I'm going to have this times C3, right? And C2 plus C3 times the number of children, or numchild, of R operations in the recursive case. In the recursive case. So see how I split it apart like that? I talk with the base case and then the recursive case. So notice I have not yet accounted for the recursion itself yet. Now, I want you to imagine that tree in your head. So just imagine it. So remember, I have a tree that looks like, like there may be a bunch of children and so on. So when I start off, I have my initial call to height, right? And then what I do is I call height on each one of its children. And each one of these will have it where it's going to call height on its own children, and so on. So notice the following interesting observation. Observe, observe the number of recursive calls is one per node. So notice I'm not like calling it multiple times on a single node. I'm calling it actually one for each one of the children, right? When I call height I, on, this, on a child, it's height of C, not height of R. So notice I'm doing it one per node. That's what's happening. So, so I'm just going to put this all together. Thus, the total number of operations is, I'm just going to combine this and watch how I do this carefully. So remember I have the part where I have a base case. Base cases happen when I have a leaf. So I'm going to have the sum over C1, and I'm going to use, just to make this a little simpler to see, I'm going to sum over all the leaves. So for each leaf in the tree, I'm going to sum C1, plus for each internal node, and I'm going to call it u. So for each internal node u, I'm going to sum c2 plus c3 
times the number of children, the num child of you. So see how I have my two cases. That's the base case. That's the recursive case. And this is what I derived right here. Over there, that's right here. So now all I'm just going to do is add this all up. So let's take a look. Well, I can simplify this a little further. Well, C1 is going to, sorry, this is going to just be C1 times the number of leaves. So I'm just going to write it like this because it's a little easier to see. C1 times the number of leaves plus C2 times the number of internal nodes. I'll call it num number internal. I just, just to keep it simple. Plus C3 times the sum over my internal nodes. Remember, I have internal u of num child of u. So I, all I did is I just distributed out all these sums or simplified them. So you might ask, Dan, what the heck do you do with this? <laughs> well, think about the sum of all the children. Remember, there's a direct relationship with the sum, all the number of children that a tree can have with the number of edges that the tree has. Well, well, the sum of the number of children um, for all the internal nodes, that's the big part here, uh, for all the internal nodes, internal nodes, is the number of edges. It's the number of edges. M, and we know that M is equal to N minus one. So all I'm gonna do is I'm just going to plop this in. Let me just move a little over that way, and I'm just going to finish this off, and then we're gonna be done for today. Uh, so let me just put this up here. So the total number of operations, so the total number of operations, so I'm just going to simplify one further. Total number of operations. The total number of operations is, so you have C1 times the number of leaves, is the number of leaves, plus C2 times the number of internal nodes, uh, number of nodes. Then I have now notice that the sum of all of the children is just the number of edges. But what's that equal to? That's just equal to n minus one. So I have C3 times n minus one, but this is all less than or equal to if I were to take each one of the constants, because remember the number of leaves can't be more than the number of nodes in the tree, same with the internal nodes. So I'm just gonna simplify this a little further. I end up with C1 plus C2 plus C3 times n, This is big theta of n, and we're done. So that's, uh, that's how you could do the analysis in this case. So notice the big pieces. First, I ignore the recursion. I count up the non-recursive work based on the cases it has. And then I do is I count up all of those, and I try to formulate a complexity function in that way. But I make the observation of how the recursion connects to it. And then I count up all the operations in total. I try to find some way I can simplify parts like this part right here. And then I try to summarize it with my big theta here. So in the notes, I've included another example where you can actually compute the space usage of, the tr of this algorithm. And the one thing I want to point out is that in these cases, you'll end up having it where the stack, so remember when every time you call a, you call, you call them a function, you have a stack pointer that points to some acti activation record, right? So you go, every time you make a recursive call, it adds this call stack every single time. Each one of those actually introduces more space that's getting used by the algorithm. I recommend you take a look at the little example I have after this in the notes. And then just give a quick peek over what a priority queue is. I also have that in the notes. But the thing I want you just to note is that the depth of the tree plays a very big role in the call stack uh, in the case when you're measuring the space. So with that being said, I want to say thank you very much and have yourself a beautiful day. 
I'll see you later.